Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Spin It Social Hour. My name is Stefan Kaplan, and it is an absolute pleasure to be here with everyone this week. Wow, on uh, show number 43, here we are, uh, Thursday, every other Thursday evening, normally at 9 p.m. Eastern Time, but today we're here at 6 p.m. Why? Well, we have a very special guest all the way from Stockholm, Sweden, and I can't wait to bring her on. I tell you, um, I'm now traveling around the world looking for the best of the best uh, in photography and storytelling. And the Spin It Social Hour is a labor of love born out of care and concern for our photo community. When the pandemic hit, I decided that I was going to create the Spin It Social Hour and try to help photographers get their names out there more. Um, you know, we've all been hit hard by COVID, but the photography community has been hit really hard as well. Uh, many jobs have been lost. Uh, work has slowed down. It's starting to pick up a little for a lot of photographers. There, we're getting vaccines and many other things, so hopefully things will rebound. But my job here is out of passion and purpose to help the photo community. So once again, my name is Stefan Kaplan. Welcome to the Spin to Social Hour. I am a social media and visual strategist. I've worked with the likes of the Pulitzer Prizes, AARP, the Jackson Charitable Foundation, uh, Dr. Alice Wilder, and many, many others. I'm also an adjunct professor at a, 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 AARP. I'm an adjunct professor at FIT. <laughs> And I am also um, someone who was a photo editor at the New York Times for 15 years. I was a supervising photo editor for the New York Times Wire Service, and it was a great honor to do that for 15 years. But now, as a social media and visual consultant, I've created the Spin It Social Hour, and today we are here to bring on Lola Akimade Oxtrum. And I have to tell you, she's here from Stockholm. She's staying up late for us, and it is going to be an absolute pleasure to bring her on. Um, so let's get to it. Um, I'm going to give her the buildup that she deserves, that we give every photographer, and I hope you enjoy this. Little uh, antsy here. So sorry, folks. I got my first shot today, so I'm a little riled up. And you know what? That's normal. So here we go. Everyone has a story, and I want to help people to tell their stories without putting them in a box, says Lola Akinmade Axtrum, photojournalist and travel writer whose best-selling book, Lugum, The Swedish Secret of Living Well, has been translated into 18 languages. Now based in Stockholm, Lola was born in Nigeria and was educated in the U.S. She graduated with a master's degree in information systems and specialized in geographic information systems for more than 12 years. In 2002, she volunteered to help the media teams cover the Eco Challenge race, roughly 280 miles around Fuji. The experience made her realize that she could travel and document her experiences with people and places. When she got back, she started a blog and went for it. It took seven years, but as soon as she developed enough traction, Lola quit her job. I'd rather be happy living as a starving artist's life, she says, than be unhappy, an unhappy programmer with lots of money. Her work has since appeared in such media as Slate, Afar, The Guardian, Lonely Planet, and the BBC. In addition to Lugum, she wrote Due North, which was a Lowell Thomas Gold winner for Best Travel Book. She also won the 2018 Travel Photographer of the Year Bill Muster Award as, as the Most Influential most influential People of African Descent Award within Media and Culture. Most recently, she was awarded the most impactful piece of writing at the inaugural Bessie Awards. It is important for me to t uh, it is important to me that anyone who views my photos sees the person in the photo and their humanity first. She says, "When you see their humanity, you can't you can't use the environment against them. You just see them." Folks, please help me welcome Lola Akimade Oxtrum. Hello, Lola. Hi. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, no problem at all. I have to tell you, I don't know what they put in that shot, but I'm all juiced up. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I'm sorry if I made a couple of bungles there, but um, I feel like my my system is revved up for some reason. So I'm going to slow down and throughout the show and let you tell your story really well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for that really warm introduction. I, I really appreciate it. <laughs> no problem. No problem at all. I tell you, going through your work, was something really just beautiful, uh, marvelous, 
inspirational and just grabbed me all week putting together that body of work and seeing the travels that you've done, all the people that you've met. And your whole story just captivated me since the minute I landed on it. And I'll be honest, I had heard of you, but I didn't know a lot about you. And um, I was on the Twitter handle, Black Women Photographers, and I was looking through a lot of things, and you surfaced again. And I said, you know what? I'm going to give her a call. And then we spoke, and here you are. Yes, yes. <laughs> so, Lola, the big question. First of all, how are you? How's your family? And how are things in Stockholm, Sweden? You know what? Uh, knock on wood, everyone is uh, safe, healthy. Um, you know, as with the pandemic, it's really rising here in Sweden. Uh, uh, Sweden has a different strategy, but, you know, we're staying as safe as we can, you know, within this. So Yeah, yeah. I know Europe is going through a lot right now. So, yes. and, and the whole, uh, you know, other parts of the of the world, so we're we're thinking of you all, um, mm -hmm. and um, it's a pleasure to be here. It's late there, so thank yes. you. For being here. <laughs> no worries, so, no worries. So Lola, tell us how did the journey get started? I mean, you know, um, it started in Nigeria, and then it came to the U.S. and then Sweden. Tell us, tell us about your journey, Lola. Well, absolutely. So you know, I was born and raised in Nigeria. I came from a, a traveling family. You know, my dad is a geologist. Uh, my grandfather was in the shipping industry. So we traveled a lot. You know, it was a family that had traveled in the blood. But then when I was 15, I moved to the U.S. to start college. And that was where I lived for 16 years. You know, went to college, um, studied as a programmer, uh, information systems, you know, worked in that field for a long time uh, before moving to Sweden in 2000, the end of 2009, kind of at the, you know, at the age of 2010. Mm -hmm. And so I've been in Sweden ever since. And I think it was that transition from the U.S. to Sweden when I was already making a major life transition. I decided, you know what, let me go, you know, for this creative passion of mine, this yeah. field, because it, um, I've always, you know, loved kind of photography and I kind of got into photography by accident, you know, actually. Really? Uh, I, used to, okay. yeah, no, I used to be an oil painter. And so when oh. I traveled, I actually took photos so I could come back to paint from the photos and then i started realizing i felt like i was duplicating effort <laughs> you know so mm -hmm. i started exploring photography as that medium of exploration exploration and so if you even look at my work you can see that i used to be an oil painter in the way mm -hmm. i edit the photos mm -hmm. so that's kind of my journey and then came to sweden and so that was the transition point where i started kind of going more full-time you know professional into uh into photography so well, we have a lot of people watching already. Uh, Ronaldo's watching. Genevieve Michelle Bryan from Black Enterprises here. Pradnia Haldapur from Silver Springs, Maryland. Damon Brown, great to see you too. <laughs> Dr. Tachi, Mediascope is in the house. Yeah, welcome. And, uh, welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here with Lola. Tim Sohn, Sohn so Social Media. Bjorn, Bjorn is here. Uh, media, uh, media tours, uh, media boat tours in New York City. Um, anyway, Lola, you know, you're all about inspiration. You are you are the definition of inspiration, um, because not only do you travel the world looking to inspire people, but now I mean, photography. Uh, you're an author. You're an entrepreneur. Um, you're a global traveler. Um, and number one, you're a tremendous human being. And you know, I have to tell you, your story captivates many people the world over. I know because I've done my research. But what is it now, at this point in your career, after having been in this space for such a while now, what is it that still drives you as this whole multimedia entrepreneur, author, uh, superstar that I call you? <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. I mean, I think very early on, I was um, lucky to find my purpose, knowing that mm -hmm. my purpose is tied to culture and connection. Right, so I grew up in Nigeria and it's over 250 different tribes that speak over 500 unique languages and dialects. So for me, culture was really very important in terms of going beneath the nuances of culture, understanding what makes us different, why we have to be different, the bridges you know, that can connect us. And so that always drives my work. Mm -hmm. And so even through, if you look at everything I do, 
whether it's photography or writing or even my new kind of entrepreneurial project, mm -hmm. culture and cultural understanding is at the core. Mm -hmm. And for me, I always say that the source of your voice mm -hmm. as a creative is often tied to a source of your pain sometimes. And when I moved from Nigeria to the US, I was isolated a lot because I was already coming in with kind of you know, my own culture, my own ideals. And mm -hmm. when I moved to the US, the US was trying to box me because they didn't know what to do with me. Mm -hmm. And so I was isolated a lot, right? And so out of that isolation came my kind of purpose of trying to build connection, trying to say, you know what, people should be able to tell their own stories themselves. They need to show you that this is who they are without being boxed. And so a lot of that translates into my photography, into my environmental kind of portraits of people where I want you to connect with the person, look into their eyes and just see them first, you know, who, who they are. And so a lot of that ties into my work, Try even with the book, you know, right, with the book right. log. I mean, it's about cultural understanding, trying to bridge and foster understanding because I feel like isolation comes when we don't understand each other. We then isolate and exclude Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, you know, the, the thing that got to me when I was reading your story and really doing all the research, and I, I really applaud you for, for your, your, you know, your whole attitude, but that's part of you. That's who you are. You're, you're, a, you're what I call a trailblazer. And a uh, trailblazer to me is the most, is the perfect definition of who you are, in my opinion, for, for my mouth. Um, but the thing is that because, you know, you don't accept anybody else's definition of who you should be Correct. you don't and nobody should but you yeah. personally have taken it to new heights because of all the different ventures you have i mean lola you have your hand if you were a chef you would have your hand in about 10 pots of soup exactly i'm toast to i don't know you know <laughs> <laughs> All digits. Yeah. It's amazing. I mean, uh, I mean, what what is it about doing so many different things that that um, that continues to inspire you to continuously jump into something else? Correct, correct. And you know what? I actually found a word for this recently, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, for for the longest time, I thought I was just a weird person. You know, where they say, "Oh, you're a Jill of all trades, master of none," all that. But I'm like, you know what? I'm actually good at a lot of these things I do. And so I found a word called multipotentialite, mm. which is there are oh, people yeah. called multipods. Exactly. Yeah, so these yeah, are yeah. people that just do a lot of things. Yeah. Uh, or they may be called a polymath, where they do a lot of things because that is what drives them. The creativity drives them. And, and they do a lot of things well, you know? And right. so... That also was a problem for me, actually, in my career, because people were trying to, okay, well, are you an author? Then pick a lane. You know, are you a photographer? Then pick a lane. And I'm like, but I can actually do all those things, and I can do them well. So why do I have to pick a, a lane? Right. Why not? Right. Why am I right. not allowed, you know, to actually just leave my full creativity right. or my full self in whatever space my spirit wants to kind of, um, you know, so right. so that's so that's one of the things you know and all through wherever i jump there is there is that thread of culture and cultural connection so no matter what it is it's that is the one thread that links it all right well you know i heard you tell a few stories and one that i listened to i listened to about three or four hours worth of video of you doing all my research and i have to tell you i really do uh it was one thing stood out was the time you said somebody asked you um, that because you've been published and work with National yes. Geographic, that they said that, oh, well, you have to be extraordinary exactly. to work with no. National Geographic. Tell yeah. us about that moment. Yeah, I, I can tell you that story because it's, yeah. um, you know, it was a talk I gave about finding your quote unquote extraordinary voice, right? Right. And so I was at a travel festival in London and you know, you know, it was great. Everybody's excited, you know, meeting new people. And so I met this uh, middle-aged uh, white lady, you know, never met before, just total strangers. And so we were talking about, you know, you know, talking shop, what do you do? Mm -hmm. And then she's like, oh, where have you been published? And I said, oh, National Geographic Traveler, you know, and, and mentioned a few places. And then she's like, really? I thought <laughs> you had to be extraordinary to be published by them. <laughs> wow. And so I was uh, stunned. You know, first of all, just stunned. 
that uh, this stranger would immediately see me and assume that I wasn't quote unquote extraordinary or there was nothing that I could offer. Yeah. And then when I started kind of processing her comments, I realized, especially talking to one of my mentors, she said that people can only see as far for you as they see for themselves. So if she doesn't see herself as extraordinary or even worthy of being published by whatever dream publications she has, then why would she see me as that, especially me, who society tries to put in a predefined box, right? So there are so many uh, you know, elements and levels to that conversation, but that was one that, was, that really stuck out, you know, kind of early on in my career. Yeah, no, I mean, it just, it left me dumbfounded in a way that somebody would actually say that to somebody. I mean, she meant no harm, of course, but mm -hmm. the fact that people have this mindset, you know, when they look at somebody, like you said, you're put in a box Correct. and you're categorized. And that is, you know, the one thing yeah. that should not be done anywhere with anyone, you know? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And, and, to, and to add, you know, you know, as a kind of black African woman, working as a professional travel photographer. Mm -hmm. A lot of my colleagues are, you know, I always say white guys that look like they just came down Everest looking all rugged and then went to go post for GQ. And then I have to kind of compete with that with a photo editor. Right. You know, there's already that kind of prejudice and uh, kind right. of like stereotyping within the industry, sure. even though my portfolio could be stronger. Sure. So those are the things that I kind of have to, I had to battle against and still battle, you know, in this industry. So. You know, that's a really great point because, you know, we even even people in the industry, I'm sure, within reason, have certain images of some people or thoughts of some people without drawing conclusions, of course. Mm. But the bottom line is that it happens. And I'm sure, you know, I, wow, the travels and the things you've done. I know now there's one place in the world. I mean, you've been to a lot of places, but I know there's one place in the world that you have right up here that you have to get to one day and yes. what is that one place lola it's the north pole no it, it, i don't know it's it's not poland <laughs> you know i always call that my little saw with a bandage each time we talk about it it's like a bandage getting <laughs> ripped off that saw right you no know, but uh you know there is a story behind it because that story kind of also frames the way i go through life you know it's um many years ago there was a competition you know uh they were trying to send a, a writer to the North Pole. And so I entered because, of course, it was the North Pole, you know, it was my dream. And then, you know, we campaigned for votes, but I missed the opportunity kind of by three votes. Right. And, uh, and then what made it worse was people that I knew and friends said they didn't vote <laughs> because they didn't understand why I wanted to go to the North Pole. They didn't <laughs> understand it. And I'm like, what? what? But then I realized that if my friends were already back then anyway, those friends were putting me in a box mm. because they didn't understand my passion mm. and my drive and my need, mm -hmm. how much more strangers, right? And so a lot of that started kind of forming, you know, my mantra, which is why not? Because I ask the question, why not a lot? And I ask it verbally or kind of metaphorically through my work or through my actions, like why not? Right. You know, why am I not allowed to go to the North Pole? Why can't you see me at the North Pole. Why can't you see me in this? Why not? Right. You know, so. Well, I tell you, um, I'm sure when any young, you know, little girls and little boys, of course, too, but little girls, especially, uh, um, you know, especially whether African-American or wherever, from Haiti, Africa, yes. wherever, look at you. They must get so inspired by your stories and your and your desire to document uh, society at large, people all around the world, you know. Um, but I have to tell you, you know, you're not only extraordinary, you're a bundle of energy. Wherever you go, I came across these photos. And I have to ask, I have to ask you before we get into the rest of your work. And, and oh my goodness. Where did you develop this signature pose of yours? Yes, it's, is, this, <laughs> is this like a Lola Wonder Woman thing? It, 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 is a, it is my signature jump. And I think <laughs> what always surprises people is that when they see me in person, they're surprised I get that eye off the ground. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I'm actually quite athletic. Like people are surprised that I get that kind of leverage. But yeah, no, it's something I do, <laughs> you know, when were I you were like, Were you into track and field that we don't know about? No, or something? I, was, I actually was a rugby player, like semi-pro for many 
Yeah, for over 10 years. So, oh, there, so wait, there's a lot, a bit of strength. Wait, stop the presses. You are also <laughs> on top of everything else, a rugby player. Yeah, I used to play rugby um, Division One and Division Two in the U.S. before I moved to Sweden. Yeah. Okay, so I have to go back and read about another 10 years worth of exactly. stuff. <laughs> wow. Exactly. Wow, amazing. But you've done this like around the world. Look at these photos. Yeah. I love these. Even yeah, the Great Wall of China. Yeah, I know, I know. Hopefully I didn't offend anybody, but uh, yeah. I don't no, think so. I, I, don't think <laughs> so. And I yeah, mean, just, I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love it. But, you know, let's, and even yes. with bees. If they bees, why not? Why not? Right? Why not? Well, bees fly. Why shouldn't you, right? Why not? <laughs> but, yes. but let's get let's get to some serious stuff here because yes. I want to let people know not only are you an incredible photographer, which we showed a huge body of your work opening the show. Uh, I hope you like the opening. Yeah, um, and but you're also, as I said, an entrepreneur and an and a, an author of several books. I know that you've written Lugum. You've also re you've also written. Um, um, sorry. Do you not? Do you Do not? North, which is yes. right here. Yes. And but also your latest book, which is going to be coming out, is not just about travel. It's about something else. And why don't you tell us about your latest book quickly? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, like I said earlier on, I'm all about culture and cultural connection and, and nuance. And so when I wrote Logum, it was about it was an objective view of the Swedish kind of mindset, both the good parts and the you know and the not so great parts. So in every mirror, she's black is kind of like almost okay, so what what is it to thrive or to live or to survive? with that mindset you know within the society as a black woman because a lot of people ask me what's the difference between between living in the us versus living in sweden as a, as a black woman and so i said okay i'll write a book and i'll fiction <laughs> i'll make it a fiction novel and give you you know kind of give it so the book is coming out in september you know i'm really excited about it it's fiction you know and uh yeah very character driven so and it's been getting a lot of great uh, great uh, reviews so i'm excited about it Okay, excellent, excellent. And um, tell us about Due North as well, because that that really that I first of all that photo is such a beautiful photo of that of that child mm -hmm. running yes. across the uh, land. But yes. tell us about Due North because that's a true collection, as it says, of travel observations, Correct. reflections, and uh, across cultures, colors, and continents. Yes. So that was my kind of first. You know, I've, I've contributed to many books in the past, but this was my first kind of solo book that I actually self published. The other two are published by you know publishers, but this one is self-published, so it holds a special place in my heart. And I wanted to create a collection of just over 20 years of travels or some of the experiences I've had, some of the stories, some of the people I've met. Because at the time when I published it, there weren't that many books, especially by black travel photographers, you know, that also kind of chronicled a little bit of um, you know, those stories and those uh, anecdotes from the roads. So I wanted to give people an insight into kind of who I was, how I moved through the world. And so the book is kind of divided in North, West, East and South, you know, and and just groups lots of different stories from different parts of the world. So. Okay. Um, so, uh, sorry, I was having a technical difficulty and I was yes. putting you on the screen. So therefore uh, you could tell everybody the story. So yeah. one of the things that um, I also know is that you've been a big speaker. You've spoken at a lot of things. You've done TED Talks, uh, many things. But I think in particular, uh, the most influential people of African descent must be truly special for you to speak at and to be a part of. Yeah, so it's, so it's a community because with the UN, the UN had um, an initiative, like uh, I think it's a decade of celebrating different uh, kind of people of African descent doing different things in different industries, right? And so it covers everything from politics to media to business. And so I was, you know, honored to be one of the um, kind of nominees in 2018, you know, into the media culture category. And so this uh, snapshot is actually from a meeting we had with the United Nations, um, it's UNTAD, you know, and they're launching the year, this year, the, the year of the creative economy. Mm. And so we were, you know, so they got lots of people within the creative fields, like, you know, one of the VPs at uh, Warner Media and Empire Records, and, you know, Bolanle Austin Peters, who runs uh, Terra Culture in Nigeria, just kind of people that 
that are making strides within culture um, and creative kind of uh, industries to come together to see how we can support and help um, amplify this UN message, this UN creative economy year. Uh, to that. So that's kind of why uh, I got involved in that. Well, I think that's absolutely wonderful because to be able to tap into anybody's creativity, I think I think in, uh, brings about something in people everywhere that um, gives them more inspiration and hope yes. in life. Um, because, you know, let's face facts, we're living in a different world right now. Um, and especially now, being at home so much, being under lockdown a lot, and many other things, I think this one period of time, it, we're going to we experience we're experiencing it now, but we're going to reflect back on it as being a time that launched a lot of people into doing a lot of different things. Yes, no, absolutely, and it really helped people. I think one of the blessings, you know, even though it's been a really rough uh, time for everyone, one of the blessings is that it's that it lets people kind of tap into their creativity, right. Right. you know, and just bring things that they normally wouldn't have brought up to the surface out, and and then because everyone is at least going through something it connected us all of us mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. way you know where now uh people aren't as vulnerable about sh you know aren't as shy about sharing their vulnerabilities or saying this is what i'm doing or this is what i need or this is where i need support so i think it has really kind of helped you know people yeah. kind of start living more of themselves of no their absolutely their Absolutely. Um, I, you know, it's funny because when you think about it, right, Lola, um, we had to stop traveling, which yes. is your biggest passion. Yes. Um, so hello, Keiko. Wonderful, to, wonderful of you to be here. So um, you had to stop. We all had to stop traveling. But it's amazing, though, because of the digital, um, all the technology that are that's at our fingertips now, we're able to cross over, uh, you know, these normal you know, distances in an instant now. Yes. And that's one of the things that the virtual world has brought forth is this ability to communicate more than ever around the world, right? Yes, yes. So I know that in particular, one of the things that you do, and we'll get to it in a bit, uh, first I want to go through some of your work, is that uh, Bjorn says that photo right here reminds him of Barcelona, and it <laughs> does, it does. But the thing is that... Um, um, your work with um, many local artisans and uh, many other creatives around the world has taken a whole new dimension with local purse, which we'll talk sure. about in, in just a bit. But um, it really is fascinating, the whole road that you continue to journey down. And I have to tell you, um, I'm so glad you're here tonight. So <laughs> but let's continue to go through some of this work. So why don't you tell us yeah. about a few of these photos before we jump into more of the other ventures that All you've right. gone into? No, absolutely. So this photo was taken in Peru in a small village called Cacacoyo. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing it properly. But there you can meet, um, you know, the ladies that, you know, are dyeing, um, you know, fabrics and creating stuff from um, alpaca fibers. And so mm -hmm. this photo was, you know, the ladies were kind of, you know, presenting, showing their work. And then this boy came skipping by. And he was, at that moment, the epitome of joy, right? Of that moment when, that we all miss as adults. Mm -hmm. Where, you know, when we are no longer, you know, that moment where you're not yet cynical about the world, yeah. that yeah. the world is just this bright, amazing oyster. And so, just in skipping by, I took that shot because that that shot always reminds me to always stay a child inside, you know. And that's also why it's also the cover of that book is always have that childlike curiosity about the world because right. it keeps you, it just keeps your spirit fresh. So, so I I assume that was an easy pick as the cover photo for your book, right? Yeah, it was. It, it, it was. I mean, just. Com composition wise as well but just the fact just the the meaning the photo has you know for me as well it um yeah it was yeah no it's it's a beautiful moment and everything and we skipped over this because we were just showing it it's so beautiful all you want to yeah. do is really look at it but tell yeah. us a moment about this beautiful photo here yeah so this was taken in uh, uh mauritius and this was uh, some of the traditional dancers they're showing so they were just kind of demonstrating how they they dance and move with the you know with the skirts and so you know, as a photographer, you're always looking for light. And I said, you know what? She's got this 
Uh, like right at the the yellow down there there's a, it feels like a flame you know like if i get her just dancing into the light i might be able to get some of that back you know light side light in and so that's what i did i just said just dance towards the light and she's like why i'm like just keep dancing towards the light you know well, <laughs> I, took, I know i know my i know my co-producer jonathan borstein who's behind the scenes and we'll bring him out in a in a bit yeah. is that i'm sure he's looking at this photo and he's very big into flamenco dancing and everything yes. so he loves <laughs> loves all of that so i'm sure yes. he, he he loves this photo just looking at it <laughs> but um anyway so you know i have to tell you I, going through some of these i picked this one because there's so much joy in this photo as well but yet the beautiful beautiful outfits uh yes. tell us a little about this one please so i always i i love this uh photo one because you know it's from nigeria i grew up in lagos and these are women that you just call your aunties, you know, they're not related to you, they're just aunties, you know. And so this was, uh, well, you can see they're all in the palm fronts. So this was Palm Sunday and in, you know, in Nigeria, you kind of dance through, this was a church procession. So you mm -hmm. dance through the streets with the palms, you know, the mm -hmm. palm fronts. And so it was just, um, there is a way in Nigerian auntie moves, <laughs> you know, that's just slow and deliberate <laughs> and just, and I'm like, I need to catch that. And so I danced, I went in front of them and kind of got low while they were dancing towards me in that kind of slow. And, and so that was it because that photo kind of captures that, um, you know, that confidence, you know, oh, of, uh, yeah. It sure yeah. does. It sure yes. does. And yes, I, uh, I, you know, I've been around a lot of cultures uh, growing up. Uh, I went to a very European school, the Lycée Francais, where I had friends from Africa, you know, all the parts of Africa, Togo, uh, many, many places and Haiti, too. And um, I have to tell you that photo that you took right there uh, definitely captured that, you know. Yeah, yes. <laughs> and so tell, this is the colors on this. Wow. I mean, I was just. I was just in heaven looking at some of these. <laughs> Tell us about this one here. So this was actually, um, uh, it was actually on a project in collaboration with South Africa Tourism and National Geographic Channel. Mm -hmm. So National Geographic Channel did uh, a bunch of vignettes following different photographers around South Africa. So mm. I was, you know, kind of taxed with going um, around Durban and KwaZulu Natal, the region. And so National Geographic, the followed me, you know, and it was like a one minute video that aired, like an ad on okay. National Geographic Channel. Okay. And so this was uh, in Durban, you know, and and so I wanted to kind of get closer to the guy because I, you know, sometimes when people kind of wear traditional things, I, I didn't want him to just be like this object just posing. So mm -hmm. I said, I want to come see you. I, you know, what's your name? I'll come straight into his face so that you just look into his eyes first before you see, you know, Right. what's around him and so for me you know that's kind of what makes this photo special is there's that connection between us you know and yeah well you yeah. know there's there is that moment as a photographer where where you can approach a subject and you take the picture quickly and then talk to the subject sometimes yeah. for a moment and then there's those times where you first really connect with the subject yeah. and then you do the same thing and you get a whole different result of course exactly exactly because Absolutely. you because you've created that moment of intimacy of of connection that brings you two together whereas if you're just a walking down the street as a street photographer and you yeah. grab that moment you may get that certain like glare or stare exactly you know? exactly exactly and, and if you see a lot of the portraits i i take where the person is looking at you right. uh, straight on for me there's that moment right there's just a moment and a photographer you know there's a moment where you're both looking at each other and right. nothing else right. and there's that moment of intimacy where you just fully see each other that's right and for that's me right. that's what i live for when i travel you know on the right. road when i take those portraits there's a moment they see me i see them and boom i take the mm -hmm. shot and then you as the viewer can then see straight at them and just see them you know for right. who they are when and those are the shots where it's you know with the eye connection shots that you Absolutely. I have to tell you, speaking of seeing things, folks, please make sure that you share this broadcast. Make sure you tell all your friends about it by sharing uh, on Facebook, on Twitter, on LinkedIn, on YouTube. Earlier, we had a bit of a connection problem with LinkedIn. I fixed it while Lola was on screen, but I want all our LinkedIn viewers to know that if any part of the broadcast was cut off, I will repost the entire broadcast on LinkedIn once this show is done. So please know that you will not be cheated out of Lola's story okay 
But Lola, I some of the portraits that I went through, I selected a few. There's something about a beautiful, warm smile that will always grab everybody around the world. This gentleman right here grabbed my heart when I looked at it because he has such kindness on his face. Tell us about this. Yeah, so this was, I think, was taken in Uzbekistan. And mm -hmm. for yeah, me, um, you know, there are some photographers that really focus on the aesthetics, right? Mm -hmm. Where it has to be kind of the right, um, you know, composition, the backlit, everything, where the person is just an, kind of an object for the photographer to create their vision. Mm -hmm. And for me, it's actually the opposite. So a lot of my photos are really, really simple, but the person comes true, you know, their personality or, you know, or you get to see them. And for me, that's what's most important because I want pe the people I'm photographing to kind of present how they want to be shown to the world. And that's why I often say that I could never be like a just straight up war photojournalist or documentary, documentary just photographer because I'm, I'm a bit too subjective for that, right? right? Because I really want the people to show themselves mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I'm almost like I'm going behind history and trying to change narratives <laughs> through my work, mm -hmm. you know. So that's why, you know, in, in that way. And so so for me, it's important if the person feels good. Yeah. I want to show just a more holistic, a more complete photo of just them as a person yeah. so that you see them first. You know, like you said, just humanizing people. Right. Um, no, I've had I've had yeah. numerous photographers on the show uh, at a forty three show now forty three shows now that have um, you know told many stories about doing portraits from Peter De Silva to Claudia mm -hmm. Paul, um, all these different great photographers, and you know every photographer has their own unique style. Yeah. But the one yes. thing that every photographer will truly agree on is that when you take somebody's portrait, they're giving you that moment. Yeah, you know? exactly, exactly. You know, I always say that, and I always say that the moment you ask someone to take right. their photo, it no right. longer becomes about what you want. That's right. As a photographer, but what they are willing to give you of themselves. That's right. I was and just that also changes the dynamic. No, it's because true. I was just yeah. yeah. No, I do. Go ahead, please. I'm sorry. No, because I say a lot of photographers, when, especially when I'm mentoring people or talking to people, and they say, "How do you walk up to strangers?" I say, "It depends on the mood changes." the moment you go in knowing that you are giving them the power to reject you right because it has nothing it has nothing to do with you and the reason why a lot of them are afraid is about that nobody likes being rejected right. so you put your own emotions above the persons right and then when people reject you they usually do it in front of other people which brings shame <laughs> you know mm -hmm. so so that's that's it it's the moment you realize it's no longer about what you want but what they're willing to give you, then it changes the way you actually approach people. Right. Well, that's why I was just speaking with a great photographer the other day, a good friend of mine, Jeffrey Salter, who does many, many covers for many magazines, um, from athletes to many other things. But he's phenomenal. And Jeffrey is you know, one of the premier portrait artists out there. And, oh, Donatella Lorch is watching. Very interesting. She says, Donnie, Donnie Lorch is a legend in my book. She was one of the big foreign co war correspondents for the New York Times uh, and um, was has lived all over the world, uh, Nepal, everywhere. And uh, she's now uh, teaching at Georgetown University. So that's an honor to have Donnie here. So, but Jeffrey, you know, says, you know, says that, you know, you're, you're capturing someone uh, at that moment, but he spends time with them, you know, talking with them and getting to know them during the shoot. Now, of course, he doesn't always have that time. Uh, as, you know, photo shoots are tight, but you still, as you're shooting, you can still talk about things that you can relate to, you know? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And sometimes travel photographers, because, you know, I work mostly as a travel photographer, we right. sometimes have less time. Like we right. can't stay in a place for a long time. We have to go through. And so for me, it's important to properly acknowledge somebody, even if it's going to, if I'm going to be there with them for two minutes, mm -hmm. acknowledging somebody, not just greeting, but actually getting their name mm -hmm. and then calling them by their name. That alone already starts creating like stripping down barriers because it already says, I see you. Yeah. And, and the quickest way you can say, tell a foreigner or, a, you know, foreigner or a stranger or somebody that I see you is by just calling them by their name. 
you know, I, I was going to wind up another clip, but we have other clips I want to show, so I didn't want to go crazy. But I did see a, a clip of you at a talk that was really touching to me, whereas you were talking about the photos that were on the screen. And I love the way you delivered the segment that you were talking about. And you so as the portraits are going across the screen, you do it. I know you know what you did, right? Remember? I Is see you. Is it the one about I see you? Yes. I see yes, you. Yes, yes. So, yeah. so, you know, I love that. And, you know, when I was looking at these photos, I kept hearing you say that when I was yeah. putting together this show. And it was very endearing. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, thank you for being who you are and the way you thank approach, you. You. For, you. for the way you approach photography and the way you approach humanity in general. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? it's, it's, it's really that's all what we want we all want to be seen just yeah. for just for who we are right yeah well damon yeah. brown who's a really incredible entrepreneur and writer uh, who's published many books says recognizing others by their name is so powerful well said yeah so thank and, you damon yeah. yeah and it's so yeah. easy to it's very easy for us to do just yeah i mean look at look at all these beautiful eyes and the and this family here i mean this family photo is one that even if I, I could just hang on my, my wall and I could look into their eyes for days, you know? Yeah, yeah and, and it's funny because the guy on the left, you know, this was also in Uzbekistan, and he was just a farmer on the side, um, like a shepherd on the side right. of the road. So we're just walking by. And then I approached him and said, oh, can I get your photo, you know, through the interpreter? Took his photo, and then 10... <laughs> 10, 15 minutes later, we're in his house, you know, he's, yeah. he's got, he's gets his family. And so it's, when you approach people, you, you never know, you know, right. what the energy you emit, you know, right. people feel it. And right. then they see, can I trust you enough to bring you into my world? He was just standing by the side of the road while we were walking by. And I said, I would love to oh. photograph him. And before you knew it, he let us into his house brought us in and was showing us pictures and stuff so no just beautiful just beautiful yeah. but you know there's also the art of street photography of course yeah. and walking yeah. around and my favorite thing to do in life is mm -hmm. you know i grew up in greenwich village and i used to love sitting outdoors on stoops and in the park in washington square park watching people go by and i realized that's what captured me about photography uh later on is that i love to people watch yeah. so capturing people on film uh, back then film and now digital <laughs> i just yeah. dated i just dated myself it's all right but, uh, i was using film too yeah. i'm older yeah. than i do <laughs> <laughs> but the thing is that that's right settle down out there youngsters <laughs> <laughs> yeah. but the thing is that you know i realized later on that's what really pa my real passion was capturing those moments on the street and this is a beautiful photo tell us about this one yeah, so, so that's the thing, because I'm also, you know, in, in between, I do some street photography, but I'm also very careful because I don't like sneaking shots of people. Right. But if the scene, if the person adds a little element to what I see, then I can kind of take that shot. So with this lady, you know, I watched her, there was that kind of natural spotlight, right. and she was looking through the windows, and, and it just made a great kind of scene unfolding yeah. in front of me, and so I shot it, yeah. right? But but normally I always try to avoid kind of sneaking, you know, shots, you know, because I know how it feels sure. to sure. to look over your shoulder and then click somebody, you know. But with yeah. this one, I always tell people that if you're gonna do kind of street photography, make sure that the person is you're not focusing solely on the person, but that the person is part of the story of the scene right. that you're trying, you know, to capture. Right. Yeah. I mean, it depends on the type of photography you're doing, of course, yes. but I definitely understand that because I'm a little yeah. mix of both. Yeah. Um, I have to say, uh, you know, I'm a New Yorker, so I'm yeah. I'm a little brazen when it comes yes. to taking some photos. But the, okay, thing okay. About it, the thing about this, Lola, is that, first of all, the light is magnificent. Um, there's nothing else that was needed except yeah. the light. But when she obviously walked into the picture, you look at this and you just wonder, you know, what is she thinking at that moment when she's looking and uh, the reflection that of that of herself yes. in the uh, window makes it magnificent, you know? Thank you. Thank you. Where, where was this? Where was this? This was in uh, France, Nice. France. Nice, okay, France, Nice. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's uh, it's one beautiful scene out of Nice, that's for sure. Yeah, thank you. So, 
Um, before we go on, let me just tell everybody, we're streaming here thanks to the incredible platform called StreamYard. I was blessed to uh, discover this platform when the pandemic hit. And I have to tell you, StreamYard is the most amazing platform there is uh, to live stream from. Here's a quick word from our sponsor. Folks, I normally wouldn't do that, but I wanted to segue into that because if it wasn't for the power of live streaming, we would not be bringing you the incredible Lola all the way from Stockholm, Sweden. So I have to tell you, it's a gift to be able to stream everywhere now. And um, But as we continue on here, Lola, um, G. Murray says here, this photo really tells a story, great highlights. You know, we have to understand there's a whole another part of course of life that we document as photographers and there's a lot of great things out there and then there's a lot of really people who do some incredibly difficult work out there every day yes. and especially a lot of women in many other countries tell yeah. us about how you feel how you go about documenting many different cultures in whether it's um the the travel stuff Oh, uh, the travels a sector or, um, you know, documenting life in general when you're capturing moments like this where women are working. Correct. So for, for me, like with this, this was shot in Nepal and the ladies, I believe, were just, they were cleaning and washing bricks. So mm -hmm. those, so those bricks could be reused for building. And so for me, it's always about disposition, right? You know, I just reading body language, reading energy, feeling if it's something that the women have been forced to do versus right. if they are actually it's just work you know to uh, as a source of income and what i found really fascinating when i was in nepal is because i, I was i stayed in this kind of homestay project in a village called uh, a town called panuati okay. and most of the women are the way the ones that run the homestay because the guys many of the guys are also like guides you know that take you know maybe travelers to base camp or you know so different parts you mm -hmm. know uh, so that community, the women are actually just taking matters into their own hands, empowering themselves, you know, and then just making their own income and, and being financially independent from their spouses. So that was very, that trip to Nepal was a very inspiring one for me because those women were just all badasses, you know, <laughs> opening their homes to travelers, making their own money. Whereas my husband always oh, is, you know, he's trekking with tourists in Nepal, but I'm, I'm good, like, you know, base camp, but I'm good here, yeah, you know. So I love that, you know, finding women that it doesn't matter even if it looks like hard labor, if right. it's something that, that's giving them kind of financial that's right. independence, independence, you know, that's, right. that I think is really, really important. Where yeah, I no. feel like I'm working with my hands and I'm doing my own and making my own money. So. Yeah, you know, I learned a lot about that from our friend who's watching, uh, and uh, I'll introduce you to her one day because yeah. you two should know each other. Her name, uh, she was on just before saying um, Nepal is one of the most incredible places for a photographer is yes. Donnie Lorch, Donatella Lorch. And, you know, Donnie lived there during the big earthquake. Mm, uh, she yes. was there with her son, uh, Lucas, and when the earthquake hit, and, um, you know, it was mm. incredible. Uh, it was so sad. It was so difficult. Um, and the one thing that, you know, Donatella did with her son, Lucas, I have to tell you, it was an amazing quick story. They actually ended up in the village of Kotdanda. Uh, they actually ended up raising after the earthquake with social media efforts and other things. And I worked with them on a few things, uh, but they did all the fundraising efforts mm -hmm. was um, I helped them with communications was Donnie raised and her son, Lucas, amazingly, like thirty five thousand U.S. dollars. Wow, for the that's village. amazing. That's amazing. And this was and this was her 10 year olds um, mm -hmm. um, thought process of doing yeah. this. He's such an amazing child, but they told me a lot about Nepal and everything you say rings true, yeah. you know? Yeah. No, no, that's amazing. That's amazing. I think once you, once you go there, you connect with people, you can't right. not like, and, and that's the thing that's amazing with travel is once you connect with people, right? It, you're never the same, right? Especially when something happens to the people you leave behind or those memories you want to help, you want to say, look, I remember I'm here for you as well. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, remember I was talking about it doesn't matter what people, what the women are doing as long as they feel empowered. 
This right. is a, a photo that shows that. Like if you go to the previous one, it shows that she's a farmer, but she's standing with pride. She's she's um, she's owning a space. She this is this is a domain, you know, and she's inviting me in with confidence. That's why I really love this photo. Well, and you think about it, you know, even here in the U.S., all around the world, um, you know, women are paid less than men, um, yes. you know, in general. So then you take the you take the other part of the equation and you put in people, you know, women who are working in really tough situations, uh, whatever type of labor it may be, yeah. um, and yet they still come out of it in certain ways because, um, as you said, it's about independence. Correct. It's about uh, earning a living and and knowing that they don't have to rely on just anyone but themselves. Uh, yeah, and plus women are just naturally resilient and tough. Of course they are. Of course <laughs> they are. Uh, my mother yes. was one of those, so yeah, I know yeah, all about it. You know. <laughs> But, um, you know, from from Lagos to uh, everywhere, I yes. mean, just the, the photos are just incredible. Um, but so I have to ask you this question, Lola. Yes. You've traveled to many cold weather countries. Yes. <laughs> okay, you live in Sweden, yes. but um, Nicole Saju says loves the subject, a very dear friend of mine, uh, family yes. to me, actually, forget friend. Okay. Uh, but the thing is that... Um, Tell us, what is your, uh, are you going to say Sweden automatically since you live there? <laughs> no, no, I'm not. Okay, like, so it where depends is, on the question. What <laughs> is, what is question. your favorite cold weather country? <sighs> My favorite cold, I really love the Greenland. I really, okay. because Greenland is just one of those places that really arrests you. And okay. lets, and shows you just how small you are as a human being. It just kind of flattens you like... You know, and when I was there in Greenland, we there was also like a snowstorm, mm -hmm. and we had to take off in a small plane in the snowstorm, and the wind was shaking the plane, and I'm like, "How on earth are we going in there?" Like, hell no! <laughs> oh, but no. we took off, you know, and it's uh, and so Greenland is just a, just an amazing place. It just feels like you know, like when you walk into a church, yeah. and then somebody tells you, shh, 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 "Keep quiet." Yeah, 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 yeah. That's how it feels. Like when you arrive into Greenland, like then it just like keep quiet. You're in a place where you have to revere. It's a reverent right. kind of atmosphere in Greenland. So, um, so that was that. Uh, and I went there because I went on. I did a photo spread for National Geographic Traveler in the UK on mm -hmm. Greenland, and mm -hmm. it was following the steps of um, the first African in Greenland. Oh wow! His name is uh, Tete Michel Pomasse. And he wrote a book, An African in Greenland, uh, based on his experiences in the 60s. And so wow. I was fascinated by this book. It was actually recommended by Marilyn Terrell. You know, she was oh, like, yes, oh, you have to check this Mar book. Yeah, Terrell, Marilyn, yes. Marilyn, I know. Many times, she actually, you know, tagged me on Twitter. And so I became fascinated. I wanted to know his story. And so, um, so I read the book and then said, you know what? I want to do go to some of the places. And so that photo spread shows my photos and then I also have some quotes about what he said of those places from the book you know like you know Ilulisat looked like this la 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 you know and so we so it was a it was a fun kind of assignment to do well I have to tell you Mar Marilyn Terrell who used to work for National Geographic I yes. met her when I, I went to Washington about four or five years ago and I had the pleasure of hanging out with her for a bit and getting to know her Nicole says uh Greenland is now on my list <laughs> yeah, you check it out. And I've got, you should check out the full Greenland uh, uh, portfolio. Just lots of fun. Oh, yeah, I'm sure everybody's going to check out, everybody's <laughs> going to check out your website now. Um, so, but one of the things that Marilyn said, and I agree with her wholeheartedly, is she called you the uh, irrepressible Lola. <laughs> And she tweeted about that this week. Yeah, she this tweeted, is if, everybody this is looks wonderful. At, if everybody looks at Marilyn underscore res, R-E-S, Marilyn, okay. M-A-R-I-L-Y-N, -E underscore res, R-E-S, you'll see her tweet about Lola. And she's a big fan of Lola's. And uh -huh. she said that Lola is irrepressible and, uh, and just one of the great, great women entrepreneurs and photographers uh, out no, there. No, no, I love Marilyn. She's, a, she's such a champion and she's amazing. And yeah, no. Thank you. She is. But, you know, 
there's something beautiful about being outdoors in general. Um, and you, you've you experienced so much. Are the Northern Light, I haven't seen the Northern Light yet. So I hope I get to see them one day. Mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, we almost did one year when we took a, a, a cruise to Alaska, uh, but we didn't. But tell me, is the Northern Lights, I mean, what is it like experiencing them? So, um, the, it, it's so difficult to explain, right? Because when you when they are captured on photos, uh, the camera, because the camera is a lot more sensitive, the sensor is sensitive, so it captures the colors more. The colors are richer when they come through right. the camera. Right. But even when you see them in person, it's still an amazing feeling because it fills the skies and just the way the light dances and, and moves. Mm -hmm. And what I think is actually fascinating because, you know, I... Um, I have a lot of contacts within uh, the Swedish indigenous uh, Sami community, you know, and I've been there and spent some time and taking photographs. And what they say is they can actually tell the weather, like mm -hmm. what the weather is going to be based on the northern lights. Mm -hmm. So what's going on, you know, at the moment they can tell because, you know, they have to move the ring there so they could see if it's dancing a lot, you know, if it's dancing right. a certain way, they say, right. okay, right. it's going to be crap weather tomorrow. Let's not move from here. Let's, you know. So, so they can. So that's what I find really fascinating: is cultures that are so tied to nature, that yeah. take their cues from nature, that read nature. It just always fascinates me, you know. And well, and, that, isn't, that, yeah. isn't that fascinating, Lola? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I got to throw no, this in there for a second because you just made me think of something really, really just fascinating. Is that here we are in this technological society and world now. And I know many people who rely on apps and all this other stuff to track weather and every, and they, listen, it's needed if, if, you know, to, to find yeah. a lot of things. And I know a couple of photographers are going to call me tomorrow and say, hey, what are you talking about? I get Sorry. great photos because of those yeah. apps. Gary, do not hate me for what I just said. <laughs> <laughs> but but Gary Hershorn, who's yes. an amazing, amazing photographer. He's yeah. one of my favorites. But you're telling a story here about people who read the weather because of the way they've been brought up, the culture, yeah. The, yeah, uh, the affinity and the tie-in that they have for understanding the weather, you know? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Reading the weather. And with this picture, because this picture was shot in Yokosiavi in, uh, in, in uh, northern Sweden at uh, Nuti Samisida's kind of reindeer camp, you know? Right. And when I was there, I've been there a couple times, but this particular time, um, I was talking to Anders, one of the guy, um, the patrons that was working there, and he was looking at the sky, and we're asking, okay, when are we going to get light? You know, you can't really predict. He it it looked at the sky, he was looking at kind of the pattern of the clouds, and he said, oh, around 9 o'clock, they'll start showing up. Yeah. I'm like, what? And then, like, around 9.05, boom. I'm like, oh, because they are so unpredictable. You know, you don't know, but but you you know that you know some certain weather conditions have to be in right. cold, clear skies, things like that. But then he was looking at the patterns of the clouds and the wind, and it was like right. mm, around this time, and then right. and then they started popping out. So I thought that was fascinating. Well, you so know, that blew my mind. One the, that's one of the things that if only more people traveled the way you do, and and many you know travel people do, because you learn so much, yes. so much by being around these fascinating people and yeah. the, the amount of wisdom that they have for the world and for nature in general is yes. just mind blowing. You know. Yes. Um, but let's uh, let's move on here because uh, I have to tell you I want to live right here. <laughs> I want to live right here because I want that to be my I want that to be I my. Know. I know. So that is, that is on Oli and Anna from the Faroe Islands, and so I was there on assignment. Uh, and uh, one of the great things I I love about this photo is because there are actually other there was a group of really young photographers, creatives that were running around, you know. The Faroe Islands, and I was kind of like this old mama tagging with them because because they were like, you know what, Oli, Anna, just get all your stuff up onto the roof because one of them was a fashion photographer, so she was working on this project, you know, and so she's like, everybody get on the roof, let's do something fun. So I was there, and I saw it. I shot this, so she got the kind of the shot she wanted for our project, but this one I got because it just felt very, I, I love the motion, you know, and kind of the energy, but when I talk about photos, like when I'm kind of giving a presentation, I say, 
as a travel photographer, you don't always want to go for the epic shot. Right. Because the epic shot from the Faroe Islands is of the Molasophor, kind of the waterfalls. Everybody knows that shot, right. you know, with just the amazing, you know, backdrop and then that kind of waterfall going straight. Everybody, if you if you Google Faroe Islands, that's the shot that comes from. Right. You don't oh. always want to go for the epic shot, but you want to go for the memorable shot, yes. you know. Yes. And yes. the memorable shot may not be as epic. So I don't consider this an epic shot, but it's a memorable shot. And it's but, a very different shot from the Faroe Islands. Oh, absolutely. I mean, so, uh, yeah. you know, when and you I think... Still, and I do have my epic shot. I do have my own, you know, of the waterfalls. Oh, you, have a, you have a lot of epic shots. <laughs> you know, I do have that. But what... But the reason I makes, picked... Yeah. The reason yes. I picked this photo was because it's it's a slice of life, as I would call it, from from just somewhere... You would never expect this, you know? Yeah. You, you would yes. not. You would no, it's, not. It's fun, you know, and the Oli and Anna, they invite... Um, you know, travelers into their homes, so they make a, you know, traditional meal and then talk about the islands. And so when this was, this was so different for them that the neighbors came out, <laughs> was like, what are they doing on the roof? And then the neighbors came with like self-taking photos because it was just a fun moment that the young kind of travelers kind of created, you know, and then I just happened to be there as well and just got caught up in the, uh, yeah. So, you know, if, if you were, we're looking at this in a magazine. If you if it wasn't part of a story, you would automatically think that it was an ad for something, you know. Correct. But it's not, and that's the beauty of it. It's that it's a real, true, to, true yes. slice of life, as I said, you yes. know. So Nicole was asking earlier, Nicole, uh, the Faroe Islands. So Faroe therefore, Island. she missed she missed that for a second. Yes. But um, you know, you were talking about being in Greenland. And you were talking also about being around reindeers and everything else. I saw a lot of photos that you took from a shoot that you did. Yes. This is, I know, one of your most popular images. Um, but I have to tell you, it, there's a reason. Is because, it, I mean, what a magical moment uh -huh. of, of, of this person, you know, feeding the reindeer. And it's like anybody else would feed their pets, you know? Correct. <laughs> Correct. No, it's, I, I really like the, the shot because of just the connection with the, there's just such a respect, you know, with the, yeah. with the, with the reindeer and, and with her. And this, I shot this on assignment for Korean Airlines. It was um, doing a spread on the uh, Gakti, which is the okay. traditional, what she's wearing, you know, the traditional um, mm -hmm. Sami yeah. attire. And then talking about the different, which ones are kind of um, ceremonial Gakti and, um, you know, kind of everyday Gakti. And so, so she wore a traditional uh, gatti because she's from, uh, she's, so she, even though this was shot in Sweden, there's a region called Sapmi, which kind of spans Northern Norway, Sweden, Finland, and then right. into kind of the Kola Peninsula. So all of that is Sapmi. So right. she is from Sapmi, but she's actually from the Norway side, you know, of, of, of Sapmi. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot you can tell just from the fabric. They, they say it's like your identification card. You can tell immediately down to which family. Wow. Even, just wow. from the Gakti. And wow. I like this because of also the lights, you know, as well. And it, it was just, it was, um, it was actually, you know, like um, kind of lights on your, in your yard where you just got like lamp posts. So it was just more the lamp post lighting, you know, and stuff. So. It says it looks like an ancient forest on their heads. Yeah, Donnie's yeah. right. It yeah. actually does. It you know the yes. reindeer look like they have trees on their heads. You know yes. their yes. antlers yes. are just so amazing. Yeah. You know. Yeah. And, so, and and the one thing I did want to say is you yes. know because I told you before I was an oil painter. You can see that how I edit the photo is very um, almost sometimes heavy handed, right? Because it is vibrant is lots of contrast because that's what my eye sees that it just comes from my past of of kind of heavy oil painting so you can see that in the photos no no actually i do in a lot of your photos i see that now and that's that's yeah. a really really interesting part of your history that i i so appreciate knowing now about you yeah. uh and your work you know and um i mean there's just beautiful scenery everywhere you go um i mean i love the the boats 
you know, uh, lined up here in, in, you know, parallel to each other. Beautiful, beautiful moment. But I'm going to I'm going to actually introduce for a second our co-producer, my co-producer, Jonathan Borstein. The reason I uh, bring Jonathan on for a second is Jonathan's a big fan of motorbikes and motorcycles. And I have to tell you, I'm, it, we saw this photo and I had to put it I had to put it in the slideshow just for Jonathan. But it's also just a great moment. Um, Jonathan, introduce yourself, please. You're muted, Jonathan. He does this all the time. Jonathan, you're <laughs> muted. <laughs> Here we are. Uh, Jonathan Borstein. I am full-time uh, uh sometime writer, part-time tech. Um, the motorcycle thing that uh, Stefan was referring to is that among motorcyclists, there's a, how to put this, almost like a cult following of what are called overloaded motorcycles. <laughs> uh, the bikes of burden and it's just some small little motorcycle a person and an immense amount of cargo yes. and um <laughs> what is it how do you do that how do you see where he's going uh, who yeah knows? Yeah. If that was me, Lola, I'd be sitting on the back of it wondering, okay, when are we going to crash? Correct, correct. No, no, I mean, I really like this. This was, this is actually a, quite an old photo, but I took this in uh, Cambodia. And what I just liked about it, obviously, you know, the guy with the glass holding it, but then who is driving? Is he, is he the one driving? Is what's going on? So that, so it's a photo that kind of is a bit layered, you know, in terms of, of what's going there. Obviously, we know there's somebody in front of him, but from this angle, it looks like, okay, what's up? <laughs> what's going it's, on there? It's, a, it's, a great, it's one of my favorites. It's a great yeah. photo. It's such a, yeah. oh my gosh, I'm just unable to part from these. Nancy loves your photos. Oh, Nicole, thank you so much. Thank Nicole you so has much. so much talent. Uh, <laughs> do we have any other comments, John? Ja Damon Brown, Jonathan Borstein, there he is. <laughs> Rose Horowitz, Jonathan, Jonathan's, Jonathan's fan club is coming out. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> All right, Jonathan, thank you very much, buddy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Jonathan is uh, <laughs> responsible for driving the car behind the scenes, taking mm -hmm. care of all the comments and helps me with the narrative of the show. And we're a real team. And I so uh, appreciate him being my co-producer. Um, you know, he, he volunteers for this effort. And uh, it's a tremendous uh, honor to have him on. Chitachi, Tachi, whoa, let's go back to Tachi. What does Tachi say? Tachi says, what a great photo. Okay, oh, uh, Tachi you. is a big photography fan. Uh, Nicole says that reminds me of my trip to Vietnam. Yes. 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 So Donnie says incredible and on Thank and on you. and on. So, you. you know, the faces, uh, the faces, Lola just tell so many stories. I have to tell you, I had to combo these two because mm -hmm. they're just two beautiful moments of two beautiful people, yes. you know, yes. um, yes. just gorgeous. All the faces you've captured, all the cultures, uh, mm -hmm. The romantic moments. Oh, what a sweet moment here! I yeah, mean, yeah, that's in Sarajevo. Uh, oh man, you know, yeah. I saw this and I just sat there and I was trying to think. Wow, you know they're in love, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, no, and, and also you know, it, you know, something private is going on there, and then to be able to, they let me just kind of sneak in and, and be part of it you know it's well it's what i love something. Those are privileges. what i love most about the moment that you captured here is that his head is just perfectly turned at that moment and you don't because of his hair that strand of hair that's coming over his eye you don't see his eyes but you know you know that he's like just yeah. totally like enamored by the woman that he's yeah. with you know yeah i mean you can see from her face like yeah. how she's yeah. uh she's just yes. like yeah. Absolutely. But now let's get to your special look <laughs> and your special beauty, because yeah. I have to tell you, um, I want you to start talking about the other special part of what you're about and who you're about, which is helping artisans around the world with local purse. I yes. want to we want to hear all about local purse. And I have slides set up. So why don't you tell us about it as I go through some of these slides, which I think may not be directly related but some are and some aren't, but they'll tell the story as you tell the story. Correct. Okay. So, um, you know, when the pandemic hit, you know, the travel industry just came to a standstill. I mean, I, I was actually on my way on assignment to St. Petersburg, Russia, and just everything stopped. Right. And so I, I, I said, you know what, immediately I just, my mind went back to the local guides and the artisans and the people that I meet a lot when I travel, because that's my beat. 
as a travel, you know, photographer is mostly kind of being with people, culture, people that are preserving. And so I said, okay, what can we do to help? And so I, you know, I connected with a, with a co-founder, Sarah Mansouri, who is from Iran, amazing woman. And so we created what we call Local Plus. And Local Plus is a web-based platform that allows us to support guides and artisans through live video shopping. Mm-hmm. All right. Which that means a lot of companies who are pivoting to virtual experiences, but we realize that, that you can only go on a virtual experience of Paris for, you know, like it's just, it, it's you could watch that video on YouTube, but what connects you to a place is usually what you bring back from the place. If you think about it, oh, I got this scarf in Marrakesh, or I got this sarong in Bali, like it creates that additional connection to the place. So we said, how can we create that connection digitally to help artisans? And so we created live this kind of live video shopping platform where. You know, you can book an experience, maybe like, uh, for example, right now, you can book a, tra- book a traditional Berber rug experience in Marrakesh, and then the guide takes you through the, you know, through the souk, and then you visit Aziz and his shop, and then he shows you different rugs and talks about the different tribes, and then you can buy live dynamically. So, so, so it's uh, something that we created, and this is where my background in tech, you know, as a mm-hmm. programmer came mm-hmm. in because we had to create this MVP quickly, you know, and so and so I was part of that process, getting my hands into the code as well and coding. Right. And so uh, so, so we've gone live with our beta, you know, and we're let's very go. early on in a, Let's yeah. treat everybody to a little clip about local purse, okay? Yes, yes. Okay, yes. here we go. Uh, let's take the banner and ticker off just for one second. There we go. Wow, that's just beautiful, Lola. Oh my God! I, Donnie says, and I was going to say the same thing. So Johnny, <laughs> Donnie just stole my line. This is a brilliant project. Thank uh, you. Wonderful, Thank says you. Rose Horowitz. Man, I my my heart is full for what you're doing with this. I have to tell you because being an artist, you know, uh, and and always creating something, and you two, you know, we know how hard uh, people who create things work, and. Arts and crafts and markets and all these places, people work so hard to make the money that they make to raise uh, their families, to provide for their families. What you're doing is brilliant. Um, I hope that local purse ends up being one of the biggest like winning projects of this pandemic. Uh, not that any project shouldn't be, all of them should yeah. be. Yeah. But I want everybody to check out Local Purse. We've been running uh, the Twitter, I mean, the Instagram handle on the bottom here. Follow Local Purse at My Local Purse on Instagram. Please check it out. You can do these virtual trips with Local Purse and shop virtually yes. through Lola yeah. and her network of uh, guides and people out there. Let's help the world out, everybody, and let's check out Local Purse, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, so no, please. Yeah. So we're currently onboarding a couple destinations, and it's, it is a long process to onboard because we have to make sure the whole supply chain, um, you know, works. 
all the way, right. but uh, yeah. Well, here's an endorsement. Here's an endorsement right here from someone, Ann Becker. I yes. pulled this off of Instagram. She said, I woke up this morning and went to Marrakesh. How cool is that? And, you know, she's not there literally, but she was. I loved yeah. wandering through the Medina and visiting a woman's nonprofit and learning about and seeing the artisanry and gorgeous colors of many different style Berber rugs. To top it all off, after a year of lockdown, interacting with the local guide and business owner was truly a joyous experience. Thank you so much, local person, intrepid traveler. Wow. Five stars, Lola. <laughs> yes. No, no, we're, we're really grateful, you know, and, and we're really young, like I said, a young startup. So we're just very early on in our journey, but we're really moving fast and trying to get the right partners on board, the right funding, everything. So Right. Well, I have to tell you, over 100 million people have lost their jobs because we had to stop traveling. Yeah. And um, the most impacted, as you say here, within our travel community are professional guides and local vendors. And you know what? My heart goes out to them. I hope that anything I do, other people do to bring knowledge of local purse to the world, I hope that uh, it booms and I hope they, they make a living, you know? Yes. Yes. So... Um, uh, once again, do you want to mention uh, about Intrepid Traveler here? Yeah, so Intrepid is our is our global partner, right? So we are onboarding lots of different guides and small artisans and, and independent guides as well. But Intrepid was our kind of go-to-market launch partner, you know, because um, so, and we went with, with them in um, Marrakesh, you know, and so we're onboarding more destinations with Intrepid as well as other destinations. So we're looking at Lagos, we're looking at... Um, you know, Argentina and all other places as well. So I'm boarding soon. So Okay. Well, wonderful. Everybody check out Intrepid Traveler, Local Purse, Lola, uh, Akin Made. And yes. please, please, um, you know, I, I tell you, what a, what a project. But, okay, Lola, I can't yes. believe I put this in at this moment. But I know, I know. I, That's, this is actually... <laughs> But I have to tell you, you know, you have to laugh in life or else you're, all you're going to do is cry. Correct, and thinking, correct. About all the, thinking about all the people who are doing so much to survive from the local artisans and everything else. Now I remember why I put this in here. I figured where we get to a point where we need some levity too. Yes, yes no, absolutely. And, and this is a shot I took in Cambodia because I, I call this an entertaining yet disturbing shot. <laughs> Because why is it? Why should the monkey even have access to Fanta to be drinking? You know. Oh my and God! So, this poor monkey is drinking I know, that, that, that I know. fancy crap. I know. I'm like, oh, why? Well, this is wrong. Oh, but, I'm, I'm but never still, it's made a good I, picture. I'm never yeah. going to work for Fanta now because I just I, said that. I you know, know, but but that's the thing, though. It's uh, because it was in uh, Phnom Penh and. Uh, there was, um, I can't remember the place, but I know there's a place where they had kind of monkeys there and I just saw tourists kind of feeding the monkeys and I'm like, don't do this. I mean, you're not supposed to do this, you know? And then the guy just uh, hands him the monkey a kind of cook, um, a kind of Fanta and I'm like, Whoa. and so I took the shot and this was from a distance with right. um, kind of telephoto. So that's why it's, yeah, you know, it's, 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 it's a, a way, really, but... really, as you said, very comical and yet disturbing yes. photo. Yeah, and, exactly. And, so, so but, this, that's one of my iconic shots. If I, <laughs> oh, it's a, it's yeah. a really, it's a win. This would win any animal contest. You know? <laughs> Goodness, <laughs> but but then at the same time, you know, it's going to also make people angry. You know, it's one of those shots where it's like, why no. should why? Well, yeah, you know, so it's, it's one of good. those. It's not good yeah. for the animal. It's not good for the animal. And that's, so all, like and that's all I meant to Fanta, by the way, was I didn't mean to slander the product. No, I'm no, just, no. It, it's I'm just saying I, I've, I've had a Fanta or two. Yeah, it's not what I'm saying is I don't want to see a monkey drinking it, though. Correct, right? correct. Exactly, exactly. So now, Lola, let's be, uh, as we're winding down here, there is a couple of other, one other thing I wanted to touch on was I wanted you to talk about Geo Traveler Media, because like I said, you're not only an author, an entrepreneur, local purse, but you've also founded Geo Traveler Media and Geo Traveler Media Academy. Let Come me show, let me show this. Let me let me pull this off the screen since we've uh, finished the slot and all that wonderful work. And let me pull up the other thing that I have ready for. Um, sorry, one second here. Here we go. I'm going to mute myself for one second, and then I'm going to show this.
Wow. I have to tell you, that is that is really I have one of the things that I adore about you and that I look up to so much is that you are a multimedia specialist and talent. But that comes from not only your creative side, but your tech background. Yes. I mean, Lola, this the, the world is your oyster. You know? <laughs> I mean, you know, yeah. it really it really is incredible um that you you can go to so many sectors and inspire so many people but tell us more about geo traveler and geo traveler academy now that we watch that correct correct so geo traveler is actually my company so I, I call it my umbrella company that covers all my creative things so my freelance writing my consulting photography speech that is and then the academy is where i'm i'm kind of giving back you know i've um, creating courses based on my experience, like with writing, with storytelling. And so we've just started, we just launched it in the, under the pandemic. This is something that people have been asking me to be, to do for a long time. And so I just never really did. So the pandemic forced me to sit down and start building it. So this is something I'm going to keep building out. We currently have four or five courses, and then I'm going to start adding more photography courses. So it's, this is, you know, as I kind of transition, you know, Mm -hmm. that I'm going to be doing more of this, spending a lot more time in the academy as well, sharing a lot of my skills and my own style of storytelling, both writing and, and photography. So that's what the academy is. Wow. Uh, really, really fascinating. I'm so glad to be able to share this information with everybody and let them know. You know, as we close out the show here, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, and I wrote this down so I wouldn't forget it because it really meant a lot to me, was... Tell us specifically, you have every year, you focus on a certain word, right? Mm -hmm. So let me take this off so we can concentrate here and talk. Um, this is one-on-one -on -one here, you and me in the world. <laughs> but tell me, you know, you focus every year on a certain word. And 2020, the word that you picked out was energy. Yes. So what is the word for 2021, Lola? Because we need Lola right now. Yeah, yeah I know. So my, my word was release. Release. Right? release. Release. Because the pandemic just showed us, as we know, nothing is in your control, right? Mm -hmm. And so if you go through life trying to control everything, control every narrative, control every situation, it's um, not sustainable. And so for me, you know, even though I felt like I was just really open, I realized that there were some parts of my life I was still trying to control. And so this year, it's kind of giving myself permission to just be, mm. to just create something and release it. Whatever happens, happens. Right. Taking away that pressure off of myself, allowing myself to be also mediocre if I want to be. You know, mm -hmm. just releasing kind of the expectations I put on myself, you know, that are kind of causing me to to um not kind of breathe you know so so that's kind of what the release is it's just releasing and and releasing whatever strongholds i still have left in my life or that's that i'm trying to control unnecessarily so right right wow uh, i have to tell you that's powerful stuff and um you know i thank you for telling us about it and um, but the one question I have, though, also is and I, I had to ask this is how do you pick the word, though? How do you decide on the word? Look, what kind of just comes naturally to you? Right. Because you're going to you start seeing patterns in your life. You start seeing you start kind of assessing your mental state, your emotional state. And then based on what you need, the word kind of just bubbles up to the surface. So, for example, yeah. the year before it was energy. I realized that there was a lot of kind of draining energy in my life that mm. I needed to remove, you know, and then um, just curate the energy around my space, you know, the people I let in, the people I, I need to push out, you know, stuff like that. So, so the word just naturally comes based on how you're feeling in that year, in that time, you know, emotionally, mentally. So it just, it's a word that just organically comes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, you know, Lola, that, that's a great way to, to close the show. Um, I have a couple of quick promotions that I have to do. Would you stay? I know it's late, but would you stay behind the scenes for two minutes? And then yes. I just wanted to say goodbye to you. Yes, but no I, everybody, I hope that everyone that's
It's been on YouTube and everywhere else. Please share this broadcast. Let Lola know that she's appreciated and all the work that she does. Thank you um, all so much. She stayed up ultra late for us to do this show all the way from Sweden. <laughs> and I hope that everybody checks out everything about you. Damon says, words are so powerful. They yes. frame our world. Yes. Montagna Thank says, you. great show. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so many people. Lola, I'll be right back. Thank you so much for being here. I'll be right with you, you, okay? Okay, yeah. Lola. Thank you. Okay. So, folks, uh, the Spinet Social Hour is coming to a close here, but please stay tuned for one second. I wanted to tell you about a couple of things. Uh, one in particular is that Stefan Falke, uh, a guest of ours previously, um, twice, uh, has a great project at the Rockefeller Center, a flag project is on, uh, and he has a photo being displayed right now in the Rockefeller Center flag project. So please check it out at Rockefeller Center flag, um, and uh, flag project rather. And I have a little surprise in store later this month, and I'll let you know about that in due time uh, with Stefan. Uh, one of my favorite photographers and human beings on the face of this earth. The other thing I wanted to say is that on Monday, um, I will be bringing Renita Roy on, uh, Renita Roy on for a Spin It Social Hour update because Renita has been named one of Magnum's, the Magnum Foundation's 2021 Fellows. And I have to tell you, um, I am so proud and excited for Renita. I had to share this. So the 2021 uh, Magnum announcement was uh, just today. And uh, these are their 2021 Photography and Social Justice Fellows. And here is the list. And in this list right there is Renita Roy from India. So hats off to Renita. Renita, we're so proud of you. And I have to tell you to do a Spin It Social Hour update on Monday. And Renita is going to tell you all about being named one of the Magnum Foundation Fellows for 2021. Renita, God bless and congratulations. So folks, once again, Stefan Kaplan for the Spin It Social Hour. Thank you for being here. It's been an incredible, incredible hour and a half. Um, and I'm lining up a great guest in two weeks from now. You'll know about them very soon, but please be well, take care of yourselves and stay in touch and connect with me on all channels at large. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.